Thanks very much. It's really a pleasure to facilitate you getting a free lunch today, <laughs> which I know is the most important thing. I, I, I run our seminar series, so I can't, you can't underestimate free pizza. Um, so no, but really it's a pleasure to be here and to talk uh, at the Beckman. I, I think I come here but once every five years. And, and so now that Bruce is gone, uh, it's kind of sad to be here, but uh, it's, it's an honor. It's an honor to talk. And so I'm going to talk about my experience at Dartmouth in, in imaging medicine. And um, I hope you'll find it interesting. I, I need to make some disclosures. I'm co-founder and president of Dose Optics. I uh, have a research gift from Intuitive Surgical for some of the work we do, and Editor-in-Chief of Biomedic JBO, which I get uh, funded for, so uh, my disclosures. And so I, as I thought about what to talk about, um, I, I want to make some statements about you know, what I call point-of-care technologies and the role of biomedical optics, and then give three little vignettes, if you will, and then uh, end on... Uh, something that I wrote an editorial about in JBO is what do I see success being in biomedical optics? And so hopefully it'll be entertaining, but this is the, the outline of what I'll, I'll speak about. So just starting at the beginning, point of care technologies and biomedical optics. And so I run the Center for Imaging Medicine at Dartmouth, and we specifically named imaging medicine for this particular reason. When I, I live in the world of biomedical optics and medical imaging at the same time. And, you know, when I do research or talk to people about medical imaging, this is basically what you think of, CT, MRI, ultrasound, uh, really something that lives in a radiology department. When I think about medicine, uh, I think about all the rest of the medical world, uh, prevention, medication, pediatrics, family medicine, geriatrics, therapy, surgery, cardiology. And, and, you know, it, it kind of sets up this very obvious sort of descriptor that medical imaging is considered and usually is kind of a static snapshot, snapshot of what's going on, whereas point of care is really interactive. And almost entirely biomedical optics lives in this world of point of care technologies, whereas radiologists rarely uh, have anything to do or think they have rarely anything to do with biomedical optics. And, and so I did a survey, and I published this in SBIE Professional last year. Uh, there's about a million physicians in the United States. And if you think about what fraction of them use are, are medical imaging people, it's about 5%. And then all the rest are kind of a mixture of medical imaging or biomedical optics technology. So there's 95% of physicians use some kind of optics. Um, and, and this is where it really hit home to me, is I uh, did a, just look through BCC research, uh, market research reports on medical imaging technologies and biomedical optics. And I was really astounded by what I saw, which is if you add up the market sector of biomedical optics, it's about 73 billion a year. If you add up the market sector of all of radiology, it's about $40 billion a year. And really, I don't think anybody in the radiology world or the biomedical optics world would know that this to, to, to be the case, that biomedical optics is literally twice the market size of radiology. I think even of all of us in the biomedical optics world would not appreciate that to be true. And it's largely because biomedical optics is very fragmented and it's within clinical departments and it's, uh, it's not as easy easily defined as CT, uh, MRI, ultrasound, uh, nuclear medicine, radiation therapy. Biomedical optics kind of permeates a lot of medicine. And then if you add in, you know, what's happening in mobile and home healthcare, uh, large fractions of that are biomedical optics. So biomedical optics is much larger than radiology and is growing faster than radiology. And, and so when you think about it, it's the, it's the singular largest technology sector in medicine today, by far. And that message is pretty much not, not well known in medicine or even in biomedical optics or radiology. Uh, so that's one of the things that I think we need to make much more clear and articulate a little better than we do. And so, you know, when I, when I say biomedical optics to people, this is typically what 
people think of some kind of a scope, right? Autoscope, ophthalmoscope. Uh, there's many different flavors of biomedical optics from very inexpensive $100 devices to uh, millions of dollars when you get up to robotic surgery. Uh, but again, it, it permeates across uh, medicine. And, and so this is what I call imaging medicine with point-of-care devices. Point-of-care, in my definition, is when the physician and the patient are in the same room together. That's kind of my working definition. Um, and so we created the Center for Imaging Medicine, uh, and engineer, it's run by engineers, so the en the academic engineers. We make uh, contrast mechanisms, devices, software tools, methodologies, and we uh, seek to serve or help medicine. And the traditional academic role, and I'm guilty of this, and almost anybody who has an R01 is guilty of this, uh, which is I come up with some cool device and I try to push it into medicine as hard as I can because that's what engineers do. You know, we have an expertise base and we basically search for some kind of medical need, right? Whereas the device world, the rest of the world, the device industry or medical world, uh, look for a need and then kind of look at the menu of engineering devices that's available and then form a company around that or, or a new product line around that. Uh, but in academic uh, biomedical engineering, this is actually what we, I think we need, which is iterative, fast cycling uh, interaction between medicine and engineering. This is absolutely essential to do proper academic biomedical engineering. And so that's what we uh, created the Center for Imaging Medicine to do. And so it was pretty simple. We took the engineering school, which is up here at Dartmouth College, and we moved uh, a, a large number of the investigators into the medical center. So the engineering school bought a floor of the translational research building. We moved uh, more than a dozen PIs who do translational medicine there, and we physically exist at the medical center every day. So this seems pretty trivial, but actually how many engineering schools own space in a medical center? Relatively few. Uh, and so we created an image-guided surgical suite um, we, with operating rooms where we can do large animals and patients, and it's 100% clinical trial use. Um, you can see different facilities. We created the Center for Imaging Medicine, which is a device development. Uh, this is when it just opened. It looks really beautiful. It actually looks like a nightmare right now of, of uh, technologies and oscilloscopes and signal generators. And probably most important is dedicated meeting space so that when the surgeons have free time, they can come up, we meet with them, we discuss, or radiation oncologists or whoever, and we have that interactive, direct, daily interactive level of meeting. And so uh, this is uh, the engineers on this side, the uh, clinicians on this side, and some of us who are dual appointed in the center. Uh, but basically, this is what it is. It's about 11 million of sponsored research um, from largely, almost all NIH funded. We have 41 active human clinical trials where the engineer is a PI or co-PI of the clinical trial. Uh, 13 existing industry collaborations, about four patents per year. And for a couple of years now, about one startup company per year. So it's been very productive. Uh, I, you know, can't go through all the different projects. There's, these are all basically R01 funded projects ongoing there. And I'll just give a couple of vignettes of the work that I'm more heavily involved with. So uh, in the area of image guided surgery, uh, I call this molecular or matrix guided surgery, uh, which is to try to help the surgeon see more they could, than they could normally see. And actually this, uh, so I gave a, a talk last year on the history of medical imaging and um, about one of the focuses was what's the nature of contrast. And so I'm basically a signal detection kind of person, a medical imaging person, where I think a lot about what's the nature of contrast. And so uh, you can think about contrast as being just simply the difference between what you'd like to see and what the background is. You know, and that's so sometimes called Weber contrast. You, we then often uh, take that contrast and we digitize it 
and we do some kind of pixelation or filtering or we discretize it in some way and manipulate it. And then we also uh, will display it or uh, use different learning tools to enhance the detection of that contrast. And so I like to think of three very different layers to contrast. There's the native contrast, there's the discretized contrast, and then there's the human detected contrast. Right? And so these latter ones are sort of functions on the original contrast. And as a physicist, I firmly believe that I should be creating tools that enhance the native contrast. And so that's largely what I'm going to talk about today is how can we enhance the native contrast of tissue. There's lots of cool computer science that I could throw at to discretize better or to uh, histogram stretch or to do volume rendering or things, but it's really improving this native contrast is where we'll get the best uh, scientific bang for the buck. And so um, I, I teach a class of physiology for engineers to the graduate students, and I open my physiology textbook and on the first introductory chapter, it says there's four features to biology. There are structural features, there are metabolic features, there are immunologic features, and then there are genetics. And, and so this, to me, sets up the roadmap of what I think that we could image. Right? And, and this is exactly the most important thing, which is as you go from structural to metabolic, to immunologic, to genetic, you get an, an extreme concentration gradient, right? Structural things exist at the millimolar concentration level. DNA exists at sub-picomolar concentration. And so it's very easy to image structures because there's a lot of them. It's very, very hard, if not impossible, to image DNA because there's very little of it per unit volume. And so as an imaging person, you can sort of see that as you go to the right, it's more detectable. As you go to the left, there's more potential specificity. And so most of the action is pushing to, oops, oops. Uh, most of the action is kind of in the middle. Uh, people trying to do metabolic imaging with respiration enzymes or immunologic imaging with uh, growth factors and receptors. Much of the molecular imaging world exists right in here. And uh, as a physicist, again, the, I, I recognize that there are basically three windows into the human body. And so these, this sets up the, the tools that we could use to image inside. We can image with x-rays, we could image with radio frequency, or we could image with optics. And so x-rays are used all the time in nuclear medicine and, and x-ray tomography. Radio frequency is used all the time in magnetic resonance imaging. And optics is used for a largely kind of surface and just slightly subsurface imaging. Um, but that's really it, is there are three window, electromagnetic windows into the human body. And so we could mix and match tools. And I, I often kind of joke if there really was a tricorder, uh, it would probably take advantage of all three of these windows. And I have to say, I spend a lot of our research time kind of thinking about how can we combine X-ray imaging with optical imaging and how can we combine radio frequency sensing with optics. And, and a lot of the uh, sort of developmental imaging we do is based on that. But the, the key thing that keeps me going in the optics world is recognizing that most of the molecular information is in this optics window. You know, there's not molecular information in the X-ray window, and there's really not molecular information in the MRI, in the uh, radio frequency window, uh, without some tricks. But most of it is really in this optical window where electron electronic transitions happen. And so uh, I'm going to start with my first vignette here, and it's because it starts here in California with uh, Modulim's invention of. Uh, uh, spatial frequency domain imaging. And so uh, we've obviously been following uh, the SFDI folks uh, for a long, long time and been excited about the discovery and invention of this. And, and so we had been working with our breast cancer team about imaging resected lumpectomy specimens for some time. 
And we tried different techniques of raster scanning spots and hyperspectral imaging. But in the end, we localized on this idea that high spatial frequencies give us something special. And so here's a, this lumpectomy specimen, and it's just been illuminated by different spatial frequency patterns, and uh, you folks know this very well. But as you demodulate that same image at those spatial frequencies, you see that you see different things, different features in the tissue. And so collagen scatters differently at high spatial frequency. Different types of collagen scatter differently at high spatial frequency. And so uh, you can see this is all white in the white light image, but in fact only this stuff up here lights up at high spatial frequency, whereas this is actually quite dark. So it kind of spatial frequencies stretch contrast in scatter imaging. And so we have an academic industry partnership with Perkin Elmer, and we've gotten a lot of good advice from David and Aman uh, about how to approach this because this would obviously be using their technology. Um, we, the partnership with Perkin Elmer was important because this, uh, we used the uh, IVA Spectrum CT, which has an, uh, an X-ray CT built into it. So we take these lumpectomy specimens and get a CT scan as well as an optical scan. And I'll just show you an example. Uh, here's a great example of in intralobular carcinoma. The physician resects it, and here's the cancer right here. But you can kind of see it's, there's not a lot of contrast here. There's, there's all kinds of things we could do to stretch this contrast. But if we can actively illuminate at high spatial frequency, this is what we see. And so we have created an image that has native, better contrast for the, uh, for the cancer versus surrounding tissue. And it's all based on the, uh, the fact that collagen scatters differently at high spatial frequency. And so here's another example, uh, X-ray CT laterally, optical scan vertically. Here's what the surgeon would see. Here's the high spatial frequency image. And here's the X-ray CT. So we're actually just kicking off a larger clinical trial where we're imaging these whole lumpectomy specimens, looking to see if there's cancer in the margin. Uh, and this is going to be a, roughly a 400 patient trial, uh, determining if the combination of X-ray CT and high spatial frequency can help the surgeon find involved margins. This is a good example because actually on this case, there actually was an involved margin right here. You can see this cancer has a little tentacle sticking out. And so in this case, there was actually a positive margin that the surgeon did not detect. Uh, unfortunately for us, we detected it more with, with x-ray than with the uh, spatial frequency, but this is only one case. Um, the other piece of uh, what I've always been a little obsessed with in, in molecular guided surgery is to get to true molecular guided surgery. And I'm not a chemist, uh, although I appreciate chemistry a lot, but I also recognize that there are th really thousands of different uh, contrast agents people have developed that really haven't translated into humans. And I have always been uh, really disappointed by that. So when I did a survey, there's probably 10,000 papers published, about 300 clinical papers, there's maybe a dozen clinical trials, and maybe four companies. Um, and, you know, the reason for this extreme loss of contrast agents is because there really is no clinical paradigm right now, and a phase one clinical trial costs too much money. And it's really risky. And um, I'll mention this later, but I just don't think this is venture capital territory. And so really, uh, as an imaging person, I'm stuck waiting for a company to develop a contrast agent, but it's not going to happen. And so I, I, I felt like we needed to change the paradigm here. And so what we, and, and there's a lot of good work going on, and I'm going to skip through this in the interest of time, uh, uh, work by Alex Weiermeyer, uh, Go Van Dam and uh, Eben Rosenthal here, here at Stanford, but they're all looking at large proteins. And large proteins are interesting and they make great therapy drugs, but they actually are very expensive and they have to be advanced by uh, companies that will have a large payback. And so for the first time in my life, I wrote an R01 grant where the entire premise of the grant 
was based on economics. And, and we, I said basically, molecular guided surgery will not advance if we're waiting for venture-based ba venture companies to advance this field. Uh, we need to find a way to develop drugs that have a low production cost, have uh, the kinetics we like, a fast clearance, high diffusion, and we d focus on phase zero trials, which is just does the drug work? Does it bind to what you think it's going to bind to? And so we partnered with Affabody, which is a company in Sweden that makes a small peptide that binds to the EGFR receptor, and Lycor that makes this fluorescent dye, and so we co-labeled them with them. And, and, and the whole goal was to show that this is affordable, scientifically productive, and um, is being developed in partnership with companies that are willing to uh, proceed, but we're not enslaved to, our goal is to de-risk it so that they will feel more comfortable developing it if we prove that it binds to what we think it's going to bind to and has the right patient kinetics and toxicity. And so that was the premise of the grant. Uh, we, it was an industry academic partnership. Uh, so we, back in 2013, we conceived this, we scaled it up, and we did uh, preclinical studies. We did our own toxicity testing in-house. We did GMP production by contracting it out to a, a large pharma company. Uh, we did our own IND at the FDA and IRB, and then we're now in phase, we're actually just at the finish of our phase zero trials. We did four different clinical trials. Um, and we're uh, just at the point where we're uh, thinking about trying new peptides now. And the key is, uh, I kind of glossed over this, but this is not a large protein. It's a small protein that can be produced by peptide synthesis. And so the cost of production is really low. Uh, so we made our own uh, surgical imaging system for neurosurgery. So this is a Pentero neurosurgical microscope. Uh, we uh, augmented it with a better camera and with a better laser and the filtering. And we showed that indeed we could image the fluorophore. And this is in a glioma surgery. So this is a case where the brain tumors opened up and you can see the, the dye has localized in the tumor. So here's the tumor, here's the white light, and it's kind of overlaid right here. So the key has been, um, does it bind to the receptors that we think it binds to? And, um, and, and do we see it in the uh, tumor? And, and, and we're injecting small microdoses in these patients. So it's a challenging clinical trial because we're injecting such a small quantity of dye, but this is what nuclear medicine has been doing for decades. And so really we're sort of following the paradigm of uh, microdose clinical trials that nuclear medicine has advanced. And, and and really, this is the success of nuclear medicine introducing new agents is through microdosing. So we did four clinical trials. Um, each of them were a dose escalation where we started at a microdose and went up and did a, either 12 or 16 patients in glioma tumor imaging, sarcoma imaging, head and neck tumors, and ovarian cancer. And so just to show you some examples, uh, here's a head and neck surgery where the uh, resected specimens are laid out. And so you can see the fluorescence in these tumors demarcating. Probably the most important thing that uh, we learned, which is really obvious in retrospect, is that EGFR expression is spotty and it, 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 it appears in little hot spots. It's not monolithically expressed, there's hot spots. And so a surgeon has to recognize that and realize that the tumor is not going to light up like a light bulb. It would, if we're going to trust this kind of a dye, it's going to have micro-regional sort of hot spots. And they need to appreciate that as they do their resection. Um, and and as a, again, as an imaging person, it really hit home to me that um, there actually is quite a conundrum in the optical imaging world, which is if you look macroscopically, you see a low contrast. But that's because microscopically, the disease is microheterogeneous. And so this is a, a, a brain tumor where you see the EGFR expression here, and it matches, the, the fluorescence pattern matches it, but EGFR expression is microheterogeneous. And so, so the local contrast could be 15 to 1. 
But if you look macroscopically, the contrast is three to one. And so actually it, what, what we need is a system that can image at the microscopic level, but present the information macroscopically to the surgeon. So that's kind of the next technological challenge for us to, to achieve. No, none of the surgeons I work with want a microscope but they all need microscopic resolution. And so there's a, there's a great technological challenge to solve here. Um, and, and just to sort of end this, uh, this illustration, the tool that you use affects what they see. And so here's the same sarcoma tumor imaged on a back table imaging system, which is a raster scanning point spot, versus in a fluorescence imaging system that the surgeon uses. And so this is the same piece of tissue, but in a surgical imaging looks like this, and on a back table flat, flatbed scanner looks like this. And so this is pretty obvious, but the type of system you use will alter what the surgeon sees. And again, many of us in the optics world kind of know this, but uh, it's becoming quite obvious. So we did a review of different surgical systems, and then I did a perspective review of what I think is needed for molecular guided surgery. And um, so these are uh, published in Journal Biomedical Optics, which is an awesome journal, by the way. Uh, think, of, think about submitting papers there. One of the things that I started was a perspective series where uh, people who have a perspective can write sort of a review. And, and, and uh, I don't want them to all to be me. Uh, they're supposed to be actually physicians who have a medical perspective and a need and write that. But I, I sort of goaded Eben Rosenthal and Go Van Dam into helping me with this one. But so I, we've been focused on small molecules. I think we need pilot trials. We, I think that if I had to bet my own money, I would say that back table imaging is going to be the major success story. And I think we need systems that have microscopic resolution, but a macroscopic field of view. So these are the areas that, that I focus on. Um, I'll give you another vignette on, on what I call photodynamic photochemo and radiodynamic therapy. So I, I just have a couple slides on this. I mostly work in this, but uh, photo release of chemo agents and X-ray activated photodynamic agents are really emerging. There's a ton of activity in this space and actually just started a, a new conference at SBIE BIOS on uh, X-ray optical interactions. So, but uh, for my entire career, uh, I have been involved in a PO1 grant with Tayaba Hassan, so we co-direct it, and uh, it's in its 15th year. Uh, so it's been a long, long-running grant in photodynamic therapy, and, and I think that everybody here probably knows what photodynamic therapy is. It's a combination of a, a drug and a light delivery, which activates like a chemotherapy, but it's, it's usually single oxygen mediated. And so we have a program grant where uh, Tayaba at Harvard does the novel therapeutics. At Dartmouth, we do the instrumentation and dosimetry. And then the two clinical arms are at Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic. And Mayo Clinic does pancreatic PDT and Cleveland Clinic does dermatology PDT. So it's been very symbiotic. And I think it's a model for how you can take programs across institutions. Uh, so very, uh, I would say mundanely, we have been making instruments to measure fluorescence from tissue. And so this is our big box solution which is a whole bunch of lasers, uh, a white light source, uh, a, a spectrometer, and a filter wheel, which gives quantitative measurements of drug levels and tissue. And so we've made these, actually the first one I made was 1997. Uh, and so for two decades, we've been making these boxes and giving them to people. And so we have three at Dartmouth, Harvard, Cleveland Clinic, University College London. We've sold a couple to Galderma and DUSA. Uh, we have one at Tufts, Stanford, Northern India Medical Centers coming online. And so we, uh, as part of our program, we make these and give them away to people just to measure drug levels. So it's, uh, it negates tissue optics and just puts a number on how much drug is there. And so on the surface of it, it seems pretty simple. And, and I think uh, it gave me, as I think about why would you do dosimetry, this is my little cartoon view, is somebody like me says, you absolutely have to know 
how much drug level is there, right? And the physician I work with says, well, oh yeah, okay, uh, it's necessary, necessary evil perhaps, but the company or the industry says it's basically just evil, you know, because there is really, from their perspective, it's just a money losing opportunity, right? Um, and so, but here's what drives me, which is we did a clinical trial in our dermatology clinic where we measured drug levels in 75 patients. And this is the, this is the scatter graph of the drug levels that we measured. Many of these patients have no drug in their lesion. You know, th these are patients who are just being treated every day. Some patients have extremely high protoport for nine levels. Some patients have literally no protoporphyrin levels, and we actually have no reason. We, d we don't know why, uh, but some are just predisposed to producing it, and some are not. And so um, this is sort of our motivator is to understand the variability in drug levels. And, and, and just to add to that, there's a big trend in photo skin photodynamic therapy towards uh, daylight PDT, which is you, you put the ALA on, and then you send the patient out into the daylight to get uh, sunlight-based treatment. And that will add even more variability to it. Um, so we've been participating with the Scottish Photodynamic Therapy Center to look at daylight levels and make sure that we can come up with predictors of when there's enough sunshine. Um, and so we actually did our own daylight PDT on mice. Uh, we didn't think we could do it in the parking lot, so we sent these students up to the roof. And they did uh, daylight PDT on some mice that were highly instrumented uh, up on the roof. And we have been basically, uh, I've realized that the dosimetry we've been doing for a long time has been great for academics, but completely useless for translation. And so we're completely focused now on building a cell phone dosimeter. So uh, using an iPhone platform, just with a 3D printed cone that we can stick on and measure the fluorescence from protoporphyrin 9. And the cell phone uh, app uh, measures the daylight based on the light sensor in the cell phone and also uh, downloads the weather report from the local weather station and predicts for the physician whether it's a good day to do daylight PDT. So we're starting a clinical trial where we measure the drug level, uh, measure the sunlight, and uh, predict based on the forecast of the local weather station, and then tell, basically tell the physician, today is an okay day to do PDT. So this is the kind of low cost, I think, engineering that we need to do a little bit more of. And, uh, we did some pancreatic PDT, I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna, well, it was, so we're doing a clinical trial at Mayo where we do pancreatic PDT, and this is really um, not gonna be curative, but the purpose is to facilitate chemotherapy. So it's well known that PDT can kind of break up a tumor. So you give PDT, you give chemo the same day, and then you can facilitate better penetration of the chemo. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, this is the really cool stuff. So, uh, so if you've been asleep, this is the time to wake up because this is, this is the cool stuff. So uh, Trenkoff light is something that I ran into um, about 10 years ago. Um, there were people in the nuclear medicine world imaging um, uptake of radioisotopes with Trenkoff. And, and, and you're all probably familiar with Trenkoff. It's that blue glow around nuclear fuel bundles in a pool or in cosmic rays, it's what produces the blue light. And in high energy physics, it's used all the time in detection of high energy particles. It's also what comes out of Godzilla's mouth when he sprays uh, blue radiation. Uh, but basically, it's, it's light that's emitted from high energy electrons traveling in dielectric. And I was actually trained in radiation therapy physics. Um, and so I realized that actually, Cherenkov light would just be coming off like gangbusters in radiation therapy, but nobody's ever really exploited this. And so radiation therapy is delivered by a linear accelerator like this. This is a Varian linear accelerator. Uh, and the beam is shaped custom to the patient. And you'll see this is a little animation of a patient on the table. And the multi-leaf collimators here shape the radiation beam in real time. And the beam arcs around and conformal therapy is given to a patient. Um, and so it's very high tech, 
Very elaborate treatment plans are designed for, and this is a mock prostate cancer treatment where the beam arcs around and the beam is tailored to this person's prostate, for example. And, and so this is a computer animation sort of showing the buildup of the treatment, but of course nobody can see radiation and it's not directly measured. This is all computer simulation. And then when the patient's lying on the table, things happen, but nobody can actually see it. The beam delivery is invisible, but Cherenkov light is visible. And so what we did is uh, with these two grad students, um, we did a study of beam delivery in water tanks, and we showed that we could, uh, through some tricks, we could, we could denoise the image and come up with a very clean image of a radiation beam in a water tank. And so this is a very complicated six-pronged radiation beam going through a water tank and that we imaged with a camera system. And we showed that we could, uh, um, in fact, not just image it, but we could image it in real time. And uh, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but we can image Cherenkov in water tanks. We could image it on tissue phantoms. Um, and uh, we published a whole bunch of papers. The key is that um, to do this, it's, uh, the, the signal level is very, very low. And so we have an image intensified camera where the, uh, the very small photon signal is picked up, amplified, and then sent to an, uh, through an image intensifier to a camera. And so a typical image looks like this, which is for a square beam, which is really, really poor. But what we realized back in 2012 is the linear accelerator is pulsed. And so we can time gate to those pulses. And uh, we can also capture the background ambient light and subtract it. And so we do time gating, amplification, salt noise removal, and background removal. And we take an image that looks like this, and through this process, we can clean it up to look like this. So we, we basically take an, an image that is gibberish, or you know, really quite useless, and clean it up so that we can actually see the beam. And, and through this process, we realized that with the right camera, the right triggering, the right signal processing, we could do single photon imaging with the room lights on, which is pretty, as an engineer, I'm just astounded by that every time I think about it, that we're imaging a patient across the room with the camera up on the ceiling, and we're capturing single photons that come off that patient's tissue with the right camera and software. And so in 2014, we did our first clinical trial. Uh, this is a patient getting whole breast radiation therapy. And our radiation oncologist is Leslie Jarvis. The head of medical physics is David Gladstone. Uh, and so this patient is getting uh, the, the beam. So she's had a lumpectomy. And uh, the, the beam is going across her chest wall. And so you can see this is the video of her. She's breathing. This is a live video capture. And this was actually, in fact, the, the first video ever of radiation dose in human tissue um, that we published back in 2014. And so since then, it's kind of snowballed for us. We've really um, had a lot of successes. I'll, I'll show you some slides on dose optics, but basically this is now the current visual interface where we see the live Cherenkov as the patient is lying on the bed. And again, these are dynamic treatments, so the beam isn't always exactly the same shape. But there's the live Cherenkov mode. Here's a cumulative Cherenkov mode. And then the software allows comparison to the planned treatment and then the cumulative planned treatment. Um, and uh, so we're doing a lot of software processing now to trying to extract out the beam edges so that we can do a direct comparison of beam edges to planned beam edges. So this is another patient. Uh, and in real time, uh, we're tracking the patient's breathing and the position if it's in an accurate location. And so we're uh, doing a clinical trial now in two different centers, uh, tracking patients during their daily fractionation for mostly for beam or delivery verification and, um, and uh, for position and intensity. We also have two other clinical trials ongoing for what's called total skin electron therapy. And so these are patients who have a, a, a skin lymphoma condition, mucosis fungoides, and um, 
they are treated in, in their entire body surface with electrons. And so here's a patient standing there and he's treated with two beams, upper and lower, and you can see the Cherenkov coming off his, his skin. We also put little scintillators here so that we can get quantitative measures of the dose. And so this has been uh, a, a really important uh, development for us and important clinical trial. This is um, studies going on at UPenn where they're imaging patients getting this uh, total skin electron therapy. And we've been uh, working with them to explore how to display this in sort of a, so you can get the full uh, three-dimensional display of the skin. And, and so we've been using computer animation techniques to take this image and sort of paste it onto a, a connect total body capture of the, of the patient and doing this in a way where we can display it for each patient. Uh, and, and so uh, this computer animation allows you to add up beams, uh, the, the patients stand in different positions, and they get their skin irradiated, and so you, we can add up those Cherenkov images, and so we can see that the dose on the forearms and on the lower legs, for example, is lower than should be, and so those patients can then be actually redosed to those sites, or, or the beam could be altered to, uh, to give a more homogeneous dose. And this is a really compelling one. Uh, we're doing head and neck surgery, uh, head and neck radiotherapy studies. This is a, a beam, a uh, stereotactic beam treating uh, a tumor right behind the eye. And one of the issues in radiotherapy is to ensure that the radiation to the eye is not, is, is, is low, as low as possible. And so you can actually see, I don't know if you, when I just started this video, you can just see the beam coming across this person's eye. Whoops. Uh, there's the beam coming across the eye and you see it actually coming out through the pupil uh, when the beam is crossing through the eye and then once the beam is past the eyeball it's not coming out and so this is the cumulative view and so we can capture we think we can estimate the dose to the eyeball based on measurements of the light signal coming out of the retina so this is a this is a, a investigational study that's going on right now uh, but then again, this is the first time that people have been able to see this kind of high fidelity radiation dose. Um, and you can see the linear accelerator here arcing around. So this is, a, this is a dynamic treatment where a very small beam is going through the head and um, there's a cumulative dose being given to the tumor at the back of the eye. Uh, I actually don't remember the name. It's just right at the back of the uh, optic retina, though. Yeah. And, and this will bring me, I think, to my last set of slides, which is sort of in the, this is what I, this is the stuff I really like. It's uh, in my, what I categorize as the crazy stuff. Um, and, and so the idea that we could see Cherenkov light from tissue made me realize that we actually could in, use radiation to inject light into tissue. And why not use the radiation beam as a tool instead of a therapy? And so the, here's the idea. If, if I have molecular probes in an animal, I could use the radiation beam as a, as a tool to inject Cherenkov light in tissue. And when the Cherenkov light excites those molecular probes, it gets captured with the camera. And so I call this uh, Cherenkov light sheet molecular imaging. And so it's a lot like light sheet microscopy. For those of you in the light sheet microscopy world, you know, you, you can arrange objectives and uh, instead of using a traditional confocal geometry or two photon geometry, you put a light sheet through laterally and then you pick up the emission vertically. So this is directly analogous to that where, oops, uh, so the light sheets here are being injected through a high energy radiation beam, but this is now not microscopic, this is macroscopic imaging. And so, uh, so we did this in a rat model where we injected an oxygen probe into a single lymph node and we raster scanned the radiation sheet through the rat and reconstructed the PO2 in the lymph node. So we showed that by luminescence capture, we could actually image uh, uh, molecular sensors within, deep within the body. And again, this is a rat. I don't know, 
many people are into small animal imaging, but imaging through a rat is really, really hard, i.e. impossible. Uh, we can image through mice, but actually imaging through rats is generally not done with optics, but we were able to do that here. We're now actually playing with imaging through human body phantoms and gearing up towards sort of the next phase of oxygen sensing with radiation beams in, in humans. And that's kind of the next clinical trial I'm interested in, in pushing. And, and so the, we partnered with Sergey Vinogradov at University of Pennsylvania who makes this really elegant oxygen sensor. It's a dendritic molecule with a porphyrin, metalloporphyrin uh, core and so here's, again, the idea of, just is a little complicated, but the X-rays induce Cherenkov. The Cherenkov gets excited by the porphyrin and luminesces. Right? And, and the excitation of these molecules is across the visible, so the Cherenkov light can excite it. And the lum luminescence is in the near infrared, so it comes out through, you know, a couple centimeters of tissue, no problem. And here's the key, is that the PO2 is uh, directly sensed by the lifetime. So the, it's, a, it's a phosphorescent molecule and its lifetime swings between 22 microseconds or 45 microseconds. And so we're do time-gated phosphorescence imaging. And so we published this just last year in Nature Biomedical Engineering that we could do high resolution uh, PO2 sensing in a tumor by sweeping these radiation sheets through the animal. Uh, and, and these are not therapeutic doses either. These are sort of the dose of a CT scan. So we're, we're sort of playing with this idea of using radiation therapy tools for molecular imaging, uh, not, again, not as a therapy, but actually as a diagnostic tool or perhaps during therapy. Uh, so this is what you would get with a traditional uh, fluorescence imaging box like an IVIS. And then this is the sort of resolution we get with a uh, Cherenkov molecular sheet imaging. And so right now, actually, this is the stuff that I wanted to get to, which is uh, we're, we're tracking animals' PO2 histograms during radiation therapy. So the tradition in radiation therapy today is you get frac so-called fractionated radiotherapy. So a patient comes in and gets a radiation dose two gray every day, and they get that for up to 30 days. And so we're doing that to mice, and, and the PO2 is different at every spot in the tumor, and so we turn that into a PO2 histogram. And in the oxygen sensing world, it's, it's recognized, pretty widely recognized, that there's heterogeneity to the PO2, and so we're tracking the PO2 histogram during radiation therapy as the animals uh, are treated, and then as they respond to the radiation. So to me, this is, the really exciting part because we're doing sort of micro environmental monitoring of the tumor during radiation therapy. So this is work we're, we're trying to get published relatively soon. And so this has kind of exploded. We have way too many people working on this. Uh, <laughs> need to fire some people, I think. Uh, uh, but we, uh, we're, we're doing radiation therapy dosimetry, molecular sensing. Uh, we're looking at targeted sensors, uh, skin imaging, breast imaging, head and neck imaging. Uh, there's just a lot going on, and, and um, so it's been fun. And so, so that brings me to the last point: is 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 uh, what do what what does success look like? And and I always thought publishing a paper in Nature would be success and getting a grant would be success, you know? Uh, that's actually pretty successful, right? But uh, as, a public, as somebody who's involved in the publishing world, I actually took a very hard look at this Nature report where they uh, re have reported for a couple of years now about the whole issue of reproducibility, right? And Nature did a survey and they looked at, is there a repro reproducibility crisis and what factors contribute and there's a whole bunch of stuff, but the gist of it is 90% of the people who responded said that nature work is not reproducible. 90% of nature readers believe that what they read in nature is not reproducible. And you know, I, I, I get it. I, I, I am equally skeptical when I read papers in very highly ranked journals because uh, until you see it reproduced by somebody else, you just never know. 
And so it, it, it sent me on a sort of a soul searching a research. And I wrote it uh, when I get do soul searching, I write an editorial. So I, I wrote an editorial about this in JBO, but basically it was based on this paper uh, by these folks in JAMA who came up with what they called the PQRST uh, method. In PQRST, they mean that success for them is publications. The Q is quality, which is citation rate, following quality standards. R is, was it, is it reproducible? S is sharing. Do you share your data? Do you share your resources? So as a good academic community should share things. And then T is translation. Does it actually get translated into industry, to startups, to clinical trials? And so, uh, actually, when I read this paper, it was kind of like a lightning bolt for me to, to realize that this is what I would consider success, is this whole gambit of you need productivity, you need quality, it's got to be reproducible, uh, you should be involved in your academic community by sharing it somehow, and then uh, there should be translation, because ultimately this is the goal of what we do in translational medicine. And so I just want to share one last vignette on translation. Because when, the, when I got into this Cherenkov imaging stuff, uh, I knew it was really interesting, and I knew it could be useful. And so I actually just bought a booth at a tech show in radiation therapy. And we, and my head of medical physics and my two grad students, we actually just sat there and sort of did our own market research at the tech show, which is a little loony, actually, I think. I'm not even sure if this is an abuse, but uh, we, uh, we, we just, I, I, we had no idea what we were doing, to be quite frank. And, and so I realized that uh, there probably was some market potential there. And I just, I needed to do this market, or we needed to do this market research. But I also learned that I could not start a company. And so what happened was I uh, searched, just like building a research team, I searched out people who would help me start a company. And I found the CEO, some advisor, Scott Davis is a, a professor at Dartmouth, but also works at Google Ventures, uh, CTO, head of software, head of hardware, and we formed Dose Optics. And, and I was very lucky, we wrote a grant, it got funded right away, we got one and a half million dollars. Uh, to, to start this um, radiation therapy imaging company. And so we moved into our tech center, which is, sounds like very similar to your innovation center here. We uh, had a lot of meetings and we designed what we thought was a better camera and better software package. And uh, we continued to sort of uh, develop this as a, as a tool and go to tech shows at a fairly low budget manner. Um, but then what happened was we got another grant funded and then we got another grant funded. And so now we're uh, five and a half million in. We just released the camera for sales and we're applying for FDA approval actually next month. And uh, we got our patent awarded. So uh, that was pretty exciting. And, and now everybody's really happy and uh, we have a larger booth and, and, and we uh, have been involved in pretty significant um, marketing discussions with companies and partnership discussions with companies with this technology. So for me, I went from knowing nothing about how to start a company to really uh, realizing that you can translate your technology. But we did it through the SBIR program. And I learned that this is a good example of a technology that's probably not right for venture capital, but is perfect for SBIR funding. And so that nuance of, you know, Making sure the product matches the market, I think, is an important lesson and one that, uh, but I, I, I'm a strong advocate of this, and I think that actually everybody uh, who's involved in biomedical technologies should be aware of how to, how to do this. And so we're now uh, have cameras positioned at six different centers doing clinical trials on the East Coast. We've got to get some on the West Coast, I guess. Uh, um, and so that's been pretty exciting. And so it's still embryonic, it's not revenue producing, but uh, we're definitely on the way to uh, having a viable company. So I think it, for me, it's been a good lesson and I can see that um, I think most medical device, most biomedical optics devices aren't exactly venture capital territory. I think this is a, a platform or a pathway that uh, many of them could follow as I think, uh, 
is well known here. So here's some examples of the imaging platform today, breast imaging and total skin. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna end there. And you know, th these are my measures of success now. Productivity, quality, reproducibility, sharing, and translation. And I wanna end on uh, a happy note, so which is uh, money. Uh, so, so I did a, another um, editorial at JBO where I looked at the number of physics and engineering grants versus the number of total grants at the NIH. Because I hear a lot of people complaining like, you know, it's so hard to get funding and, you know, why even try? And, you know, but actually if you look at the number of grants awarded to physics and engineers, uh, it's been growing and growing. And actually if you look at the number of total number of NIH grants, it's actually been kind of plateauing slightly. And so if you divide those two, you get the percent NIH grants funded in physics and engineering. And there's something pretty radical that's happened. Actually, just in the last three years, the number, the percentage of grants where the PI is in a physics or engineering school has doubled just in the last three years. So that I think there's incredible opportunity, actually. Uh, and this is sort of showing that I think quantitative science and engineering has value and is really valued at the NIH. And so for me, this is, is an exciting um, piece of data and, um, you know, is, is a motivator to, to write some more grants. So I'll end there. Um, I, I can't list all the alumni. I, I just recently did a lecture where I sort of surveyed all our alumni. I have 150 alumni from our, our laboratory, so I can't show them all, but here's the postdocs and grad students currently in the lab, the dose optics folks, collaborators, uh, NIH funding, and, and collaborating companies. So I'll end there, thanks. Usually ending on money kind of stimulates people to sort of. Yeah. So I was really hoping to say success is just a larger booth. Yeah. Well, it's a larger booth. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of nuance to this as a product. Uh, it, it, yeah, so that is definitely the goal. It, it, could we use it to dynamically target the beam and increase or decrease the dose or gate the dose? You know, um, we're in some discussions with partners where um, gating the dose to breathing is a big deal. So when the, sometimes patients are told to do a breath hold and sometimes they don't. You know, and so turning the beam off quickly when they don't do what they're supposed to do is important. Um, so we're, again, we're at kind of an early phase. We definitely, I think, will get to the point where we alter the beam, but that, that's a big switch. You know, we're, right now we're kind of in diagnostic mode, but for sure it will happen. And one of the biggest paradigms that's happening in radiation therapy is complete automation from beginning to end, you know, the, the Varian and all the big companies are rolling out more and more features where the beam delivery quality control is as automated as possible. And so I, I see this camera as one piece of a fully automated delivery system where the, the, the system can check itself basically and know that the beam was delivered where it was supposed to be delivered. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's gonna, replace too much, it's just going to add on to what exists today for QA and uh, quality control. Yep. So you mentioned that there are some aspects of devices that are good for XPR funding and some that were good for venture funding. Yes. Some that weren't. Yeah. Can you expand upon that and what details you think make Sure, yeah. Well, again, I, the business part is, is not my strength, but here's what I've learned. I, you know, venture capital is looking for a 10 times payback typically, right? And so if you invest $10 million, they're looking for 
hundred million in, in payback. And I think a lot of biomedical optics devices are useful or additive, and they really would be good products, but they're probably not at the hundred million dollar level. You know, um, this may be, I'm not totally sure, but I, I think it's hard for me to prove that today, you know, but so biomedical optics companies like Olympus and Pentax and, and Toshiba, they produce small iterative devices all the time, you know, that don't have enormous payback. So those things exist and biomedical optics things get created all the time. It's just, it's hard for us as an investigator to convince uh, Olympus to invest, right? They like to invest in their own ideas or, uh, you know, if it's not, you know, large companies are a little loath to invest in things that aren't de-risked already. So I think the best way to do that is to do what things like Modulim has done and, and others, which is develop it yourself, uh, do it in a cost-effective way, de-risk it, and uh, then once you've proven it to a certain level, then a company will jump on board. But I, it's very, very hard I think for most biomedical optics devices to get venture capital in early, just because the huge payback isn't there. So to summarize, SBIR is more early, early phase. Yeah. You, you, you just have to be good at grant writing. You know, if you, if you write a good SBIR, it will get funded. And it's free money. It's like millions of dollars of free money. So. Yeah, sure. Um, the work in the diffuse optical market is also fascinating, but I have never, never really seen a tremendous commercial success in the diffuse optical market. I mean, a lot of that has to do with signal to noise ratio and the fact that it's such an ill posed, inverse you know, problem. Yeah. Uh, the long signal acquisition times are required to get meaningful reconstructions. So, what do you think are the honest to God applications of? <laughs> you, you notice I didn't actually show any slides on diffuse optical tomography, right? <laughs> I've spent most of my career in diffuse optical tomography, but I didn't show any slides. Um, that's a tough one. Yeah, I think that there's great research potential, and um, um, I, you know, I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's lots of things that we invent and use. I, most, of the, most of my life has been inventing things that are really interesting, but may not be cost effective in the medical world. And I, I accept that. You know, I, I think that's good research. You can still do good basic research. You could do, still do good physiology research. Um, uh, uh, you know, I think that there's... Uh, I think probably one of the most promising things is things like chemotherapy monitoring, you know, that, that have been developed and pioneered here. Um, so they're very niche. For sure it's going to be very niche, and I, I don't see like a big app. I see niche apps. Is that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I've spent way too much time on ill-posed inverse matrix solvers. <laughs> Eric, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, as you guys know here very well, uh, we're just really following what's been published here. But um, as you go to higher and higher spatial frequency, it's kind of like I th the way I think of it is like picking up light from a smaller and smaller spot, and and the and and also the angle change, the angle of scattering light changes. And so the way I think of it is if you change a collagen fiber, you know, if you make it larger or smaller, or if you change its orientation, I think that you'll get changes in backscatter um, that get picked up or not get picked up at high spatial frequency. And so I think it's basically a function of the phase function of the backscatter. Surgery, you're talking about how the scale of the contrast, the fact the scale of the micron scale. Yep. So nobody wants the microscope, but 
How do you integrate those two? You can have your, you know, yeah. you give the best of Man, that is, that, that is exactly what I think would be the most exciting thing is, is, and I've been racking my brains to figure out a way to do this, but to image something the size of my fist with microscopic spatial resolution. So get as many pixels as you can, uh, but then still there's a depth of field issue and, you know, having that watch field of view with good depth of field is actually is an optics challenge without some kind of a deformable mirror solution or some kind of but astronomy has solved this right the, the trouble is most of the solutions astronomy uses are really expensive so uh, but translating that to uh, to biomedical optics would be a great well, innovation what yeah the end of the day, you got to scale it down so you still see the micro picture. Exactly. How do you make use of that microscopic information? Do you need to begin one by one? Do you have virtual reality? That, that's where machine learning, I think, has the, the exact role, which is you, you need, we need tons of information, microscopic level resolution, but the surgeon doesn't want to see that. They want it uh, distilled down, and so uh, some kind of machine learning algorithm that picks out the hot spots and sort of informs the surgeon in a very simplistic way or utilitarian way uh, that this is cancer and this is not is what what is needed I think so it's a great if any of you guys can invent that honestly that'd be an awesome grant yeah for the chart of my infection you see to me you get the, the, somehow like a surface dosage of yeah. the radiation yes can yeah. that be somehow correlated to what actual dosage you see by a tumor region yeah, yeah, great question. Yeah, so I, I mean, I kind of glossed over that, but uh, the Cherenkov comes from the superficial layer about five millimeters in. You know, it's not through the body. What radiation oncology world would really want to know is what's the dose to the tumor inside or the, the target region. Um, yeah, we can't see that. <laughs> but we are working on algorithms that image both sides of the tissue and project the dose volume. Uh, again, there's a, la a layer of computation there, which is approximate, but I think that's possible. But, it, but largely what we can do with Cherenkov imaging is soft tissue surface dosimetry. So uh, breast cancer, head and neck, that's specifically why we focused on those clinical sites, breast cancer, head and neck, and uh, um, total skin. Warm. Okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think my guess is that the reason why it's not really done is because there's no reward for doing it. Do you have ideas of how you are implementing that or trying to solve that problem? Yeah, it's a great it's a great thing to think about over a drink or something, you know. But um, you know, you know, I, I we try to publish in nature journals, you know, whenever I have something really hot, cool, and exciting, I absolutely send it. Try to send nature medicine, nature biomedical engineering. I want to publish there, but by the nature of that, those hot, cool, exciting things are probably the least reproducible, right? I I don't mean like it's not real, but it's there's probably some risk to its legitimacy and 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 if you think i've again you can read my editorial but if you read about the motivating factors in science people get promotions they get financial benefits from publishing in those journals uh, so the motivations are very strong to publish in these journals with stuff that you think is okay but maybe not uh, totally reproducible that's unfortunately the society we live in um, so, uh, you know, that, that's not going to change. That's not going to change, right? And it's up to the individual investigator to have the integrity to make sure that they're doing reproducible science. And, you know, when I read something that seems fantastic, you know, until I see it reproduced by somebody else, it's still in the category of fantastic, right? Um, so you should publish in JBO instead. <laughs> Because everything there is reproducible. <laughs>
but that's the nature of, of science. And I think as, as, as you become an investigator, you, you, you have an eye of skepticism when you read stuff, right? And you, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so, you know, tumors are evolving all the time, right? And, and so um, s some tumors are homogeneous in receptor status, but I think the vast majority are at some level of, uh, of growth. And, and so if you look at a, every pathologist knows if you slice a tumor open and stain it for H&E, that you typically see hot spots, right? So there, I think the growing part of the tumor, for example, may be more expressive of EGFR, and the more quiescent parts may be less expressive. Um, but heterogeneity is a part of the microenvironment of tumors. Um, so as we go into this field of molecular guided surgery, if we think it's going to work, uh, we have to be cognizant of the fact that, that it will likely be microscopically heterogeneous, what we see which is a challenge, but not, not an, you know, there's ways to solve it. Yep. Sure, yeah, with, with uh, um, you know, there are lots of molecular probes being developed that could be used. Um, uh, I think that you could use a high energy beam uh, to do diagnostic imaging. And that's one of the things that we're trying to push in advance is using high energy beams as a diagnostic tool. The key you run into with any uh, agents is, is it important enough to do an IV injection? Right. And so if it's important enough, they'll do an IV injection. If the information they get is of value, that's okay. But, um, you know, if it's a screening situation, for example, you're not going to do an IV injection. But I think it's quite possible. And, you know, it's, it's a little non-intuitive, but you actually get less dose from a high energy beam than you do from a low energy beam. So I think there's actually some great arguments, and that's what I argued in my my grant was uh, you actually, if you want to do molecular imaging, I actually think the best thing you could do is use a high energy beam because you actually get less dose than an x-ray. So, okay. So, sorry. Yeah. Um, you, so you mentioned you showed the funnel with all the molecular probes and then yeah. uh, the narrow funnel to it. And so you, you part of this academic industry partnership with a couple of body, yep, yeah. yeah. And so that was about, sorry, about four years ago, I believe. Yeah. So you're day zero right now. Um, yeah. So have you seen anything just with, in terms of kind of just a change in terms of how are more of these forming, these sorts of uh, relationships forming as, you know, as you've got higher in this effort or? Well, we, we, I definitely work with several groups who are advancing small molecules. You know, I, I, I personally think small molecules are the best way to go for that clear and are low cost to produce. Uh, I think they're gonna be the, if we're gonna get uh, molecular guided surgery into the clinic, I think it, we've got to do it that way. Um, so uh, I've been encouraged that the number of device companies has really grown. I mean, the, now, you know, we have this molecular guided surgery conference and there's about a dozen companies now that have some level of FDA approved device to do fluorescence imaging. You know five to six years ago, there was one or two companies, you know, so the field has really exploded technologically. What's really lagging is the contrast agents. So, and again, it's really risky to make, you know, the, the payback is really low in contrast agents. And so no company in the right mind is going to advance these without 
some significant de-risking happening. So that's what we're trying to do is de-risk it. Well, I think any last questions? I will leave you with the last message that you should really consider Journal of Biomedical Optics for your, for your publications, and thank you. Thank you.